We're glad to have Marty Broom from the Darien Congregation, Darien, Georgia, to speak to us tonight. Many of you know the Marty. We've been working with him for several years, and we're glad to, to have him here tonight to speak to us. Uh, Eric, would you lead us in a prayer, and then Brother Marty will speak to us. Let us pray. Dear God and Father, we thank you so much for this uh, time to be here together as for, for the summer series. We're thank you, thankful for Marty and for his uh, time to come and speak for us, another part of your word that's very important to us. We pray that we would apply these things to our lives and we, we wish that we would uh, be better people to you, that we might glorify you in every way that we can. We realize, Father, that uh, life is short and that we don't always uh, uh, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We pray that we would do everything that we, that we can to serve you and to bring more people to your, king, your kingdom. At this time, Father, uh, please forgive us of our wrongs. We're also mindful, Father, of those that are sick, those that are hurting, hurting right now, uh, those that have serious illnesses. We pray that you with each, with each and every one of them. Please be with us and keep us safe this evening, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good, e good evening. <clears throat> I sound a little hoarse. I am. Uh, we uh, had a little, little dry weather in South Georgia after all the rain that we had, and I got, I got out and mowed the grass, and uh, and I was so dirty, and I had breathed in such dirt that it just uh, totally clogged me up. And so I'm usually very loud and very boisterous, and so it's to, to your benefit that my voice is froggy tonight a little bit. Uh, this way you won't have your problems. We're so thankful that the elders uh, invited us to be with you tonight. Uh, and we're also thankful for all that you've done for us over the years. Uh, the congregation here in Jacksonville is, has been supporting our, our work for a long time. Uh, not only financially, but also with the house to house, heart to heart magazines. And, and those things are just uh, a blessing. Uh, they really work real well in our area. Uh, I also want to thank Alan, even though he's not here tonight. Uh, thank him for uh, giving up his, his pulpit, so to speak, uh, uh, to allow me to speak. And, and also all the members. I know some of you that have come to Darien uh, in the past, uh, but some of you I've never met before. But I appreciate all of you anyway because it takes all of you collectively to do all the great works that y'all do. Uh, and y'all have helped our congregation so, so many times. Uh, just recently, uh, we purchased a, a double-wide mobile home. Uh, and uh, we use it for fellowships. Uh, we use it for a place for my, my wife and I to, um, to get out of the attic of the church building and have a place to stay. Uh, and we also use it for spiller Lazarus rooms. And so that was <clears throat> quite a blessing to be able to, able to have that. You know... Uh, our work area is, it wouldn't be there without y'all. Uh, we could, couldn't have it. We wouldn't have it without your financial support and without your prayers and without your emotional support uh, that you give us. And so we're thankful for that. One of my, my favorite memories of, of Darien, besides seeing Alan go down one of those giant slides, you know, that was pretty funny. But other than that, one of my favorite uh, memories of Darien was we had been there about two years and a man and his wife came in the back door and actually the side door and they had four house to house heart to heart magazines in his hand and I saw them right away I knew what they were I had a big smile on my face because I thought ah ha ha this thing, this thing works <clears throat> and he said I've been reading this magazine, and I want to come and find out more about the church that I read about in this magazine. And so we came, and we studied, and I baptized him, not that day, but within a few weeks. I baptized him, I baptized his wife, and I baptized three of his own children, and because of your 
I never had knocked on his door. You know, you, know, you, you never hear, I've always heard preachers say, well, if you go out and knock doors and, and, and beat the bushes, you're not going to bring people to the Lord. It's not always the case because I've had a few uh, that have come in the back door and they had a house-to-house heart mag- magazine in their hands and you caught that and brought, brought it in. Not me. And we're so thankful uh, for you doing that. You know, I that I, that I talked about Purdy, he is one of our most faithful members uh, that we have. Uh, when I'm out of town, he preaches for me sometimes. Uh, he uh, leads singing. When I first met them, his wife said, I, I can sing quite well, but my husband can't carry a tune. And he, he's one of our better song leaders. You know, it's just one of those things that uh, he just, just doubted his talents and abilities. But uh, we're so proud of, uh, of what took place. You know, tonight as we gather together in this building, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's a blessing to know that all over the world, brothers and sisters in Christ are meeting in situations just like this for Bible study. And then on Sunday, the Lord's Day, we're going to meet again. The church is going to gather together, and we're going to gather around this table, and we're going to remember Jesus and the great price that he paid to give us salvation. And we do those things uh, because we're commanded to, but we do those things because we love the Lord. And we want to remember the supreme sacrifice that Jesus made and to worship and honor our Heavenly Father. You know, we're lifted up when we come, we come together. We're lifted up when we come together on Wednesdays and Wednesdays. Wednesdays. And we're lifted up when we come together uh, for worship when the church is together as the body of Christ. And hopefully, we're encouraged too. The inside of these walls, we find security and hope. Don't we? But outside these walls, what do we find? A, a world that seems to have lost all hope. Evil like we've never imagined there. there. Greed and selfishness, and lack of respect for the very lives of others. We see those who are sick and discouraged, who seem to have thrown up their hands and quit on life. And they are dying a little more every day. And they're dying lost. They're dying lost. And and it's our changing orders to find those people and to, to teach those people and to give them a chance at salvation by the Word of God. You see, outside of these walls, that's what, that's what we see. But as Christians, we don't face that type of discouragement, do we? Our lives are pain-free, right? Every day is sunshine and rainbows. Correct? We know those things are not true, are they? And they're not true. We face hard times. We go through trials that we never dreamed of. We face circumstances beyond our control, and we too become discouraged. But the difference between us and them, we have hope. We have hope that Jesus gave us. You see, I see a hope that outside of Christ, we can never ever really know about, can they? But inside the church, we can actually have hope because we have hope of, of an eternal home. That he's promised. God is faith, faithful to keep his promises, is he not? Now let's, let's look at the, the words of encouragement in the church at Smyrna in Revelation 2 8 through 10. Which is 2 8 through 10. Tell me that at a quarter of the deal that I'm supposed to stop. And so if I don't stop quarter till, I want someone to stand up and just, you know, get my attention up because otherwise. My dad told me a time ago, if you want, you want to be a preacher, son, you got to have the gift to go. And any of you know me very well, I got a double, double dose of that gift to get. Isn't that right? Yes. yes. Revelation, Revelation 2 8 through 10. And to the, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things said first and the last, who is dead in life. I know your works. 
tribulations and poverty. But you are rich. And I know, and I know the blasphemy of those, those who say they are Jews are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are, you are about to suffer. And indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison. Maybe you may be tested, and you, and you will have tribulations for ten days. But be faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. You see, you see the church at Smyrna was, was one of two congregations talked about in Revelation that had nothing, nothing negative about them. About them. Yet, they, they still to hear these, these words. It is strength and encouragement to face the coming days that were going to, going to come their way. You see, I had already endured persecutions. But the Lord told them, told them, it's going to be worse. It's going to be harder. Some of you are going to face death. Some of you are going to be in prison. And so because of that, he wanted, he wanted to warn them that just because you grew persecuted, get ready because it's going to get, going to get rougher. But it went. See, they wanted to be encouraged. And Jesus was there to give them hope. Jesus was there to encourage them. Not the words that gave to, to them. The encouragement. But these weren't just written, written to the Christians at Smyrna. They're written to encourage all those who suffer for Christ's sake. All they were trying to hold on. And tonight, I hope they'll encourage you. Hold on, hold on. Stand firm. Stay, stay strong. A crown, a crown of life awaits too. Not, not just in Smyrna. Every day, the date of September 2001, imagine that every, everybody's room is what that was, right? Right. Everybody remember, remembers what that place. Most of us have been, been at for a few, for a few hours. And either saw, either saw it on the set or something, or someone told us, and we went and found a telev television, turned it, turned it on. And, and one of the most evil acts of terrorism ever, ever admitted, admitted in our, na our nation laid out on our, on our television screens. And, and since that time, we have heard of heading and murder murders of those who dare to oppose these, these, ex these extremists because, because we're friends. Profess to be Christians because, because all of them are uh, enduring this preaching and art. All Christians, but they, but they at least profess to be Christians. Uh, these, these people are after them. them. Which natural disasters has to happen? Like tsunamis and fires and hurricanes. And y'all might know a little bit about, about tornadoes, right? Uh, we're so blessed, blessed that nobody was hurt, at least here. You know, things and problems can be replaced. It's hard, it's difficult, it's easy. But it's one of those things that the Lord was watching out for, for sure. And, and we, we were all during prayers on behalf, behalf uh, that things would, things would go well for y'all. And uh, it, looks, it looks pretty good. You know, I don't know what all, all the plans are to start the rebuilding or whatever, whatever but things are, looking, things are looking up. The apartment complex that's just down the street, they don't look so good. good. You know, the whole top's all, all blown off and everything. And, uh, might not reveal. Maybe that's going to be the case. The case I don't know. Really, we watched the fires in Nicaragua that that the church churches and placed those in the mission field in danger. We've heard about missionaries and in Honduras who were attacked and they had their cottages ransacked. The computers and computers and equipments were stolen. Uh, and also, also the, the the missionaries there are their possessions. Causing some to have to return to return to the states. Also, witness faithful, faithful congregation of the Lord Church. Church, they were torn apart by petty fights and squabbles. And it's sad to hear the congregation be torn apart because the congregation could agree on what color to paint the church building. Yeah, it happened. And you don't think the devil has a part in that? Oh yes, he does. He's there, and he's inciting, you know, riots of sort in, in order to bring habit upon the, the Lord Church. 
We've also seen it come back by those who would seek to water down God's Word and make it more politically correct with a thinking of our world. I so dislike like that word, politically correct, because it's said, said in such a way that the, that the people that say it think that it's okay and that it's right. And we can change, change anything that we want as long as the, the majority of poli, poli people believe it's okay to do that. And sometimes, and recently, they've, they've made altercation changes to the Word of God. It's just the, the laws of the land. Allow, allowing same-sex marriage, things of this nature. You know, that the Bible, Bible totally condemns. There will come a time of time in this nation. I, I don't know how long it's going to be, but you're going to say, well, right here at Fat, Fat Man, this is one time, and, and, I, and I should have written it down. It's going to have to happen in our nation that we're, we're going to be forbidden to preach certain thing, things from the pulpit. And if we do, there's probably going to be some locations for it. It's going to happen uh, in our, na our nation because it seems to be going in that direction already today. And that's so sad. Jude tells the what? Come on, y'all can talk and talk. Jude, you got to contend for the faith, right? We have to contend for the faith. We have to stand up for those things, things that are right. Uh, and that takes sometimes, it takes hurt on our part. It takes courage on our part, part uh, to be able to stand fast. Unmovable. Not tossed to and fro with every, every whim of doctrine. But we have to be people that, that, that hold fast to the doctrine that the apostles gave us that they got through Jesus. During time, times like this, even the most faithful may become discouraged. Just told the early Christians in Revelations 2, 9, 9, I know your actions and your poverty. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. Now what was that all about? Do we know? The Jewish Christians were persecuted at first more fellow Jews than they were from Rome. The Jews in Rome gave them any trouble at all, at all is because the Jews sick to them all. How do you think Jesus was crucified? Jesus was crucified as the Jews turned on him. And they convinced that that convince Rome that everybody had done that one that way and that he was causing her heresy. Uh, even though Pilate fe felt that Jesus was innocent and he could find, find no wrong in him, still because of the Jews. And it continued to be like, and, and the Jews gave the Jewish, Jewish Christian fits, gave them all kinds of trouble. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you the devil that some of you are in prison to test you. And you, and you will suffer persecution for days. Be faithful even to the point of, point of death. We'll give you a crown of life. What, what did that mean? It meant that Smyrna Church had, had already endured persecution and slander. But they were going to face, face more persecution, possibly prison, even, even death. Smyrna was not a friendly place for Christians to be. In fact, in all of Asia, Asia Minor, Smyrna was the, probably the worst place for Christians to live. Cicero called Smyrna one of Rome's most faithful allies. And Smyrna proved its loyalty to Rome again and again and again. They, they erected temples in honor, in honor of Roman gods. There was, was even an altar on Caesar that, that they built, where once a, once a year every citizen was expected, expected to burn innocent incense and declare Caesar Lord. If they were willing, they were issued a certificate. If not, if they refused to honor Caesar and call him Lord, they were persecuted. They had to be, had to be excluded from the guilds. 
where they were allowed to buy and sell, this would be an unemployment and poverty. But when you read Revelation, it talks about the mark of the beast. This is what the mark of the beast is like. People were forbidden to buy and sell, and forbidden to, to even have jobs. Because I would not bow down to Caesar. In today's society, just recently, I've heard people come to me and they say, you know, the mark of the beast is coming now. They're going to have technology and they're, they're setting it up where they're going, they're going to know who we are. And if we're Christians and we, have, you know, and, and if we don't have that special barcode, they don't understand Revelation, do they? Revelation was written to seven churches of Asia that had existed at that time. It was written to people as a warning of things that would come. And the things in Revelation talks about took place. They have already took, took place. Except for what? For what? Judgment Day. The day, the day of judgment. All the other th things in Revelation have already happened. But if you turn your TV on and you listen, listen to some of these guys that talk about Re Revelation, they'll scare you to death. You know, because... They believe that Revelation mentions things that, things that sound like Apache helicopters. Now, how, how could the church have rides about an Apache helicopter that wasn't even invented for 2,000 years later? These prophecies in Revelation were prophesied and they were, they were there to the seven churches of Asia. That's why it was addressed to them. To them. And that's something that they need to know. They need to be warned about how bad things were going to be. To be. Early on, the church heard exactly from this requirement of bowing down to Caesar. And why were they? Because the Jews, I mean, the Romans considered the Jewish Christians just to just be part of Judaism. And, and so because of that, Judaism was a, a religion that worshipped one God. And so because of that, as long as, as long as these Jews would pray for Caesar, then they would allow them not to have to worship him. And so the Jews were allowed to buy on this. But they were at first allowing the Christians the same benefit because they were Jewish descendants. But then the Jews started stirring up a stink. And they let them know that, look, these people, even though they call themselves Jews, they're not, they're not the same as us. They're seditious. They're troublemakers. They do not honor Caesar as Lord because they believe Jesus is Lord. And so because of that, the th things Christians in that area changed totally. Uh, and then they were persecuted. They couldn't buy food. They couldn't buy trade goods. They couldn't work. Can you imagine how that would be even in our society if we couldn't buy food and we couldn't get a job? That'd be bad, wouldn't it? It's not like, like all live on farms anymore. You know, back when, back when some were children, y'all raised all your crops. You lived on a farm. You raised... You raised all the food that you that you ate. You had hogs, and you had chickens. You had beef, and you grew all kinds of vegetables. I bet you even ate field corn, didn't you? We did. Love it till to this day. I love it better than sweet corn myself. But these people were being persecuted. Because they wouldn't honor Caesar instead. You see, they were accused of being rebellious and seditious. Acts 17 7, it says, they were viewed as a dangerous element in society that needed to be eliminated for the good of the empire. 
That's what Jesus said about them. And apparently these Jews in Smyrna successfully convinced the leader that Christianity was a dangerous religion that threatened the good community of Rome. And thus the church, they lost their exemption. That's where the phrase comes from. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2.9. Can you only imagine that church at Smyrna was struggling? You can't buy food. You can't work. Uh, persecution was coming from all areas. Yet what I admire about them the most is highly, highly prudent as they were. They remained faithful. There was nothing bad said about them. It wasn't like some of the other congregations that were talked about that had lost their first love or a lukewarm congregation. This was a congregation that was still worshiping God and still very faithful in spite of all the bad things that were happening to them. It makes you wonder if a little persecution isn't a good thing. The Bible tells us to rejoice when we're persecuted. You know, and sometimes I believe in our society that, uh, I mean, it's not like I have a death wish. I don't want to be persecuted, okay? I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is sometimes when we have it too easy, when things are too easy, don't we slack off and stop trying a little bit? We don't quite work as hard as we once did because things are just so simple for us. We're one of the richest nations in the world. And, and so because of that, you know, things are easy. How many of you have air conditioners in your houses? Yeah, we do. How many of you have at least one automobile? Probably at least two. Say, we'll say two automobiles your house. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing? No. We, we have things easy. We don't have to have to work. How many of you have a sickle push on board you mow your grass with? Raise your hand. Nobody. Can't believe it. I learned to mow grass when I was seven years old with a sickle in a too, by the way. Uh, lawnmower. That's what my dad, because I'm afraid I'd cut my foot off with uh, a motorized lawnmower at first. And so, but we have, we have uh, riding lawnmowers, don't we? And we have uh, gas weed eaters and things of that nature. We live in a nation that we're petted and we have it so easy. And I'll be the first to admit, I like it that way. Because I remember growing up in the late 60s and early 70s when we didn't have air conditioning in our houses. We had a thing that young people won't understand. It was called attic fans. And we opened our windows. Or some people just used box fans in the windows. And, and that's how we cooled ourselves. And surprisingly enough, at nighttime, with the attic fan on, sometimes you'd even get cold and have to pull for cover. In August, in Georgia, you know, I remember those days, and I remember how it was. We didn't have microwaves. We didn't have cable TV. We had an antenna that picked up three channels. Is that the way it was around here? We picked up three channels. And it was static a lot of times, and you had to go outside. You had to turn that antenna to, to get the station that would come in strong. When we had a motorized thing that turned our antenna, I was so pleased because at that time I was my dad's antenna turner. He, he would get out the window to me and he would you know, tell me, turn it a little bit more this way and a little bit, little bit that until, until we figured out exactly where it needed to be. You see, you see, we have it easy. We're pampered. I remember back in 1980, the first time I ever went on a, a mission trip out of the country, I went to the Republic of Panama. And I can remember seeing children eat out of garbage cans. And I had just gotten out of college, but I was so, I was so emotionally disturbed about seeing that, that, that I bought quite a bit of food 
to feed these kids that had nothing to eat. They were eating stuff out of a trash. Any of y'all ever ate out of a trash can before? I don't think so. If you did, you probably were two or three years old and you didn't know any better. You know, but uh, you see, we have it so easy. And so because we have it so easy, we don't work as hard. And we don't try as hard. We hold back sometimes what we should be doing. Because it takes, it takes fire with a lot of beating metal to sharpen a sword, right? It does. It takes some adversities to make it strong and where it can endure. Some of you older folks like me probably remember difficult times in your life and you had things that you had to go through that you wondered, how in the world are we going to make it through this? How are we going to... How are we going to endure this affliction? And you made it through. And at the end, after you came out of the affliction and the things that you went through, you found that you were, you were stronger. And every time that you went through afflictions, you came out a little bit stronger. Because that's what it does for you. It makes you stronger. And the church at Smyrna were on fire for the Lord. They were strong in the faith. They preached the gospel. They were sound. And when people persecuted them, the Bible doesn't say this, but this is my words. They probably said, is that all you got? You think? Maybe not. But what I'm getting at is they could endure. They were rejoiced when they persecuted for, for righteousness' sake. But we have to make one thing clear. Christians are going to suffer. The Bible tells us we will all suffer in this world. You see, we all are going to suffer. The rain's going to fall on the just and the unjust, right? Peter wrote the Christians of his day, 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trying trial of your suffering as though something strange were happening to you. And again, he encouraged them, in 1 Peter 5 through 9, be self controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. When you're going through hard times, doesn't that make, you, make it a little easier when you know somebody else is going through it too? It does. When someone else is going through, through similar situations that you're going through, it makes it a little e easier for you to, to hunker down and get through it because you know that you're not the only, only one. And scripture that talks about that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. We don't have lions in Georgia. We don't. But I've been to zoos before, and you probably have too. One time in Albany, when my daughter, she's 35 now. She's not, she don't want me to say that, but she is 35. She's 35 now, but when she was about four years old, we went to Albany, and we went through a little zoo they had there, and it was a... It wasn't, it wasn't like Atlanta Zoo or Jacksonville Zoo. It was pretty simple. But we went by this cage, and it had a tiger in there. And that tiger was laying down, and it was probably from about right here at my foot to that joint there. That, that's about how long that tiger was. And it laid there, and it looked like it was dead. It wasn't even moving its tail. It was just laying there. And my wife and my son and my daughter... And my sister-in-law and her husband and their little boy all walked past. And that lion said nothing. He just laid there. But when this big fat man walked past, the lion said, you know, 
That would make a good meal now. And it jumped up and it lunged at the cage and it tries best to get to get to now. There was a barrier, you know, with a chain that, that you could get too close, and so that tiger couldn't get to me. But I learned then that when I read this scripture about, about that the devil is like a, a roaring lion, I'm told, I've never seen it happen, but I've been told that a lion can jump a fence with a cow in it. Oh, that's what I thought. I thought. I want no part of that lion. No part at all. You know, I'm kind of even a little, little nervous around bobcats and that small little cats that we find in Georgia. But a lion, the devil is vicious. The devil wants us with all of his might. And he'll do anything, anything to get us. He's coming after us. And we have to be ready and alert because he doesn't mind harming you to make it happen. You remember the story of Job and all the things that happened to Job? On day one, what did Job lose? He lost all of his children. They died. He lost his house. He lost his livestock. We're not talking about 10 or 12 cows and bull. We're talking about huge, humongous herds of animals that he had, that he lost. And then he was covered with what? Bulls. There's part, part, some places in this world wouldn't know what we're talking about when you said a rising or a bull. I bet you do. I just know you do. Because when I was a little boy and we lived in Lyerly, Georgia, y'all have heard of Lyerly, Georgia? Close to Somerville, Georgia? Not far from Rome, Georgia? Are we getting close? We used to play when I was about nine years old on a little church driveway you know, that they dug up. And we played, and I had my Tonka trucks and, and all those kind of things. And we got risins on us, bulls. There's sores that fester up. They're as big as the end of your finger. And they'll fester up. This is a gross show. I mean, it's full of pus. And it doesn't pop easily, does it? And it hurts real bad. And sometimes they won't pop at all. And sometimes you have to go have them lanced. His whole body was covered with sores like that. His whole body was. Even in his hair. You ever had chicken pox? You remember when you had chicken pox and you had sores? I still got, my hair's thin enough now, you probably can see them. Uh, I still got scars on my head where chicken pox I scratched because my mom would tell me, don't scratch that. It'll leave a scar. It, it left scars, but it was under my hair, so nobody knew it until now. <laughs> so, and there's still scars up there from chicken pox. He had holes all over his body, and it hurt. His friends came. Were they any consolation to him? Did they help him at all? Encourage him? They said, look, Job, we know you have sin in your life. Can confess your sins and make this right, maybe God, God will have mercy on you. They, they did, did no good at all. And then his wife, I mean, she was there for him, what? And she, she, Job, curse God and die. Just curse God and die. You see, he was enduring all those things. And, and, and how is it that this came about? The devil noticed Job. And he noticed how faithful he was. And God knew he was looking at Job. And God said, you can do anything to him, but don't take his life. Because God knew what was inside of that man. He knew how dedicated he was. And he knew how strong he was. 
And I imagine these people in Smyrna were a lot like Job. They were people that were tough and they could endure and they would endure because they loved the Lord. They loved God and they wanted to serve God. You see, we live in a world that's just full of hate and turmoil and sin. You know, otherwise, how could you explain how there could be a Columbine or deliberate acts of terror on the World Trade Center or the Pentagon or the mass shootings of a group of Christians gathered together to worship God. I mean, they're now coming into church buildings when people are worshiping and killing people. Have you ever heard of congregations that form secure meetings, committees? They have to have security co- committees. And what are they doing? They're having people carry guns in the war service. The way I look at it is if I die for the Lord, Lord what better way to die? You know, what better way to die? You know, but it's happening today in our society. And it's appalling. How can you, do you believe that you would ever live to the day when people would go inside church buildings and, and kill people during worships? I never would have thought it would happen. But it does. Because we live in a, a fallen world that Satan's domain is ugly, is ungodly, is a sinful world that's full of greed and hate and selfishness. And it's hard to even explain how bad it really is. But in the face of all that hate and selfishness, we, the children of God, have a promise that we can hold on to. A promise that was given to the church at Smyrna and a promise that's just as real and purpose filled for us today. We want to hear, we want to know that the trials and the temptations and the persecutions that we might sometimes suffer through won't last long. Those are the words the church at Smyrna needed to hear. They're the words that the church in Darien and the church here in Jacksonville and the church worldwide needs to hear. And those are the words of the church at Smyrna that was given to them. The words that gave the early church hope to hold on and to endure. And they are the words that give us hope today. Jesus told them not to fear. Do you know how many times in the, in the Scripture that the, the words fear not are written? Anybody know? 365. How many days are there in a year? 365. You, you think that's a coincidence? No, I'm like Gibbs. No, I don't, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe God, God meant it to let us know that we should never fear. There's not a day of this year that we should fear. To have faith in God that He's always going to be with us and He's going to protect us and He's going to watch out for us. We are going to face persecutions. Some people are going to die for the cause of Christ. And many have over the years, especially the first and second century Christians. They died. But he tells them in Revelation 2.10 to be faithful even to the point of death and I'll give you a crown of life. Now think about it. You lose your life but to get a crown of life and get to live in heaven with God forevermore. How does that weigh it out? Oh, yeah. The crown of life. That's what I vote for. The crown of life. You know, the struggle goes that face in life and the temptations and the things that cause us. I've seen too many people that were dedicated to the Lord, that were serving the Lord, that were strong in the faith. They're strong gospel preachers and elders. And I've seen them walk away. Walk away from it. And just throw up their hands and give up. 
It can happen. But the Bible tells you these words, take heed lest you fall. Now, I believe it's there for a reason, don't you? If it wasn't was it possible, it wouldn't be in there, would it? It's possible that as, as strong as we are, that we can fall if we're not pressing on to that mark. If we give up on our focus on heaven, you know, the pathway to, to heaven is, is straight and it's narrow. And it says that few there are that are going to find it. But the path to destruction is broad and is wide and everybody else is going down. Kind of reminds me of Interstate 75 or 20. You know, 59. That might be closer to y'all. It reminds me of all that kind of truck. Lots and lots of people heading down the path of the destruction. But the path to heaven is, is a straight path. And it's a narrow path. And few there are that are going to find it. And when I look at the Lord's church, I think about that analogy. I think about the parable of the souls and, and how many different kinds of souls there were. were. How many different kinds of souls were there? That's four. And of these four kinds of souls that were mentioned, how many of those souls are to the end? One endured to the end. And so when I think about the path to heaven is narrow and straight, and few there are that are going to find it, and I, I read the parable of the souls, and that how most people eventually are going to fall away. That shouldn't discourage us. That should motivate us to work harder and be stronger and be diligent because that old devil of a lion that's seeking you like a lion, he's coming after you. Someone was supposed to remind me at 15 till, quarter till, and they're supposed to stand up and they're supposed to say, stop, and it's all your fault. Because nobody in here did this. And so in just a moment when the kids come in, and y'all can come in, children, come on in. Uh, when they come in, then we'll finish up this lesson uh, sometime before morning anyway.
Song of Encouragement will be number 456 before uh, Brother Marty brings us the invitation. Let's sing number 590. 590. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing. know how lucky you were that I saw the clock. My dad was preaching one day, and he's 89 years old, but he's been a preacher for, oh, 60 years at least, and he was preaching, and the clock, something confused him about it, I don't know what it was, but after an hour and a half, after an hour and a half, he discovered that, uh, that something must have been wrong. Because he tell by the looks on people's faces, you know that, uh, you know that, that they were getting a little tired. And so, and I've not had an episode quite that bad, but to, to, uh, at least well over an hour before. So it has happened. Tonight we're talking about persecution, uh, and even though we're extending the Lord's invitation, I think that's something that that we still can go with a little bit. My wife Beverly and I have a friend, her name is Tanya, and she, she was diagnosed with breast cancer less than a year ago. And she went through chemo and surgery and radiation, and, and she handled every minute with an attitude and strength that I've never seen anybody before. She never stopped working at her job. She was a speech pathologist at Valley State University. She never became bitter or ask why me, and she never missed a worship service. Her attitude was one of resolve, and no fear, just let's do this. Let's just do this. After chemo was over, they repeated her scans to be sure that all was clear, only to find her cancer had metastasized, And she went from returning to work on Monday, ready to start recovery, being told on Friday that she had four to six weeks to live without treatment and four to six months to live with treatment. Through all of this, she remained faithful. Her trust has never wavered. Even knowing and understanding the prognosis that they gave her, she still remains strong and she's still alive right now, even though her time is very short. How can someone endure all of this only to be disappointed is because of her belief in God's promises, is it not? To remain faithful and I will give you a crown of life. She has taught us all not how to die, how to live. To remain faithful and I will give you a crown of life. And in the audience decides there might be someone here that's not a child of God. But I know that there's lots of people here that are Christians. And then the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, are we remaining faithful? Are we serving the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength? Are we dedicated to the Lord in all things? You see, 
The Lord knows our heart. And I know some people think this is your heart. This is, that makes a lot of noise, don't it? This is a pumping station. But this is your heart. This heart is, is what you think. The Bible says what a man thinks, so is he. God knows your thoughts. I remember as a preacher's kid, and I know everyone thinks the preacher's kids are the worst, but as a preacher's kid is growing up, I can remember sitting in the audience, uh, and I would daydream. I would daydream that the auditorium was full of water and that I was diving off the podium and swimming under the pews. Now, I might fool the people that were sitting next to me. They saw that young man sitting there singing loud and, and a smile on his face, and they probably thought, you know, that preacher's kid, he's all right. He's going to be a fine young man. Well, luckily things changed. But what I'm getting at is, is sometimes we're here. We're doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons. We come to worship because we feel bad if someone calls us and says, hey, we, you wasn't there, Andy, and we, we didn't see you. Why wasn't you there? And so a lot of times peer pressure keeps us here on sunny mornings and sunny nights and Wednesday nights. But are we really here? Are our hearts here? Are our minds and our focus and our concentration? Is this the love of our life? One of my favorite movies, and I know this dates me, but y'all see gray hair, so you expect it, don't you? Was City Slickers. Y'all remember the, city, the movie City Slickers? And in the movie City Slickers, they talked about the one thing. The one thing that's the most important thing in life is to find out what that one thing is. Well, we as Christians know what the one thing is, don't we? It's to love God and to put Him first in all things. You know, we sing the song in our songbook, and I can't sing for you tonight because I'm all hoarse, but, you know, all to Jesus I surrender. We sing that song. But is it really true? Are we surrendering all to Jesus? Or is it more like 60% to Jesus, I surrender? And some of us, 30% to Jesus, I surrender. And others, maybe you, you believe in tithing. So it's 10% to Jesus, I surrender. You see, the Lord knows our thoughts. He knows actions. I was a youth minister for 30 years. I can't count the number of door knockings that, that we did and, and mission trips that we took and, and all those kind of, kind of things. You know, and when I wanted to take the kids to Vogel State Park to go camping, 40 kids just like that. I mean, I could, could fill the bus up. If we want to have a door, door knocking, seven or eight kids. You know, I, I believe numbers are barometers of spirituality. All to Jesus I surrender. And a number of this size are we people that are knowing how to live and living like the example that Tanya has set for us. If you're here tonight, and if you're not certain of that eternal life that the Lord offers, He's offering us an invitation. We have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We have to be willing to confess Him with our mouth that He's Lord. We have to be willing to repent of our sins. And the word repent sometimes throws us a curve because we say, what does the word repent mean? Some people say repent means to turn around. Repent means to 
change your mindset. When my daughter, she's back, she's gone with my grandson someplace, but uh, when she was about three or four years old, she would ride along, and, she, and we would talk about things, and she would you know, she'd say something that was silly, and we might laugh or whatever, and she would say that she needed to change her tape. You know, now, this is before computers. You know, this was before anything like that at all. The only thing she knew about tape was cassette record tapes and eight-track tapes that I had in my old car. But she would say, I need to try and change my tape, Daddy. And repentance is changing your mindset, changing your tape. Back in the 70s when I was a young man, there was a song that came out and, and, and it describes it pretty well like this. you got to change your evil ways. And they threw in this word baby. <laughs> but that's what repentance is. we got to change our mindset and how we live. And, and so we got to have faith. We have to be willing to confess Jesus. And not just when we come down the aisle and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When we're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel, when you're preaching the gospel, what are you doing? You're confessing Jesus. Every time you tell someone about the Lord, you're confessing Jesus. So you've got to have faith. You've got to be willing to confess His name. You've got to be willing to change your evil ways. And then you've got to be willing to be baptized. This baptism is not an outworking of your faith that you do just because you want to show God that you want to please Him. No. This baptism is told that if we do this, we have to do it or we can't be saved. It's what washes our sins away. Until you're baptized, you're not saved. I don't care what the preacher told you, that believing in God will save you. The Bible does not teach that. You have, to, you have to be baptized to have your sins washed away. And then you're guaranteed heaven. Uh, many of you here have been baptized. You hear you're Christians. But the Bible tells us to take heed lest we fall. You see, we, we can fall. We can slip up. You have to live, live faithful to the end. And if you live faithful to the end, you too will receive a crown of life. Tonight, if you're a Christian, but you become discouraged, I hope that our talk and our lesson this evening has encouraged you a little bit to remember who you are. You know, when I was a kid growing up and I had to go mow somebody else's grass or do work for somebody else, my dad would always tell me, son, remember who you are. Remember who your daddy is. Because when you're out in the world and you're doing things, you're representing me too. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. That was a popular little thing a few years ago. Remember whose you are, who you belong to. We belong to the Lord, don't we? And we got to live our lives like we belong to the Lord, that we belong to Him. Tonight, if you need prayers to come and be restored and be renewed by, by knowing the same words that was uttered to the church at Smyrna. And I promise that if you remain faithful, I will give you a crown of life. And if you're not a Christian, then you're not even in the race yet, are you? You have become a Christian in order to even have a hope of eternal salvation. If we can help anyone in any way tonight, please, please come. While we stand, while we sing.
Thank you, Marty. Appreciate that lesson. If you did not pick up a copy of the news and notes, do that before you leave. Notice those announcements, those that need of our prayers. Remember, Grayson and Chance Hicks, they're both home taking care of each other tonight. Chance has bronchitis, and Grayson has Rocky Mountain, I never, I never can say it right, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. For us to pick that up during Bible school. So let's remember them as we pray. Also, uh, remember, uh, Sister Wendy Roach has moved now, and she's in room 212 at the uh, assisted living in Fort McClellan. Remember the community meal coming up on the 20th of July. The cards for invitation cards are in the back. Be sure and pick those up and give them to your friends and neighbors early. Invite them to the community meal. Let's stand for our closing, no closing song. Let's stand for our prayer. Je uh, Jeremy, would you lead us in our prayer? May we pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the prayer we have to worship without harm, to be able to study thy word, to draw, draw strength from the encouragement we give to one another. We're thankful for missionaries, especially the missionaries in this country. We have many in this congregation who are mission, missionaries in their home, Father. Help them to be able to be the light good as we all to lead as many people to heaven as we can. Father, the many are hurting and sick. We ask for better health if it will. will. We also ask for uh, give us the opportunity to serve our, our siblings in Christ, Father, to bear each other's burdens, to up, uplift each other, and give each other dignity in the time of need. Father, forgive us when we fail thee. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.